one. Hello and welcome to the Roundtable podcast. I am Shogun and joining me today is my very good friend Ainsoff. Ainsoff is one of the OGs, the original gangsters of the Roundtable server. He was here since the very beginning and he was, I believe, my third podcast ever. So we've now done hundreds of podcasts, I think, you know, 300 at least. And uh, the third one was with Ainsoff. Ainsoff has the unfortunate distinction of being the most unlucky man I've ever met. Um, <laughs> He has suffered a incredible string of horrible hardships, tragedies, and setbacks in terms of his mental health, his physical health, and his personal life that I deeply empathize with and um, have always felt, you know, compassionate sorrow because of the amount of suffering you've had to go through, but also enormous admiration and respect for the grace and dignity and wisdom and compassion with which you have endured those incredible hardships, which I'm quite certain would have easily destroyed me many times over. And I think 99% of people would not have survived them the way you have. Uh, and I would also give you the uh, credit of being probably the most benevolent person on the server, maybe up there with Kusheka, uh, for, you know, really just a, a bag of sugar and spice and everything nice. <laughs> so, said, please join us on the Roundtable Discord server. I will get into this wonderful story because it does have a very happy ending and a silver lining in progress. Uh, but we are on the Roundtable Discord server. We are on YouTube. We are on BitChute. Uh, you can find hundreds of great podcasts. Please like, follow, and subscribe. Every single like, every single positive comment, every single subscription helps. Also, if you check the announcements channel, you'll see we now have a new video series with a brand new YouTube channel ma managed by Ainsoff himself. I apologize for my cat. He wants to go outside. So join that because that's where we have our new video series. We have a great podcast up already with Zoo about Anzu, the Sumerian entity. Deity, very interesting stuff. A great podcast with a talking cobra. You don't want to miss that. Uh, also known as Open Eye Project. And now Insoft's podcast. And we have a new Twitch managed by Neverborn. We were not yet able to stream anything, but keep an eye on that. And we'll be streaming podcasts in the days to come. Live videos, that is. Also, make sure you've listened entirely to the Andy podcast that is available on RT Podcast and on announcements. That's with my ex-wife, Mandatory Viewing. And especially make sure you listen to the whole server meeting recorded today. Very important. Don't miss it. Also available in announcements on RT Podcast. Sorry for the overly long introduction, my friend. Thank you for joining me. How are you? Today, I'm doing very well. Thank you, Shogun. Doing very well. Thank you for asking. Good. I'm very glad uh, to have you. Uh, it's glad to uh, have you on the podcast. I'm looking forward to our conversation. You're looking well. You're looking handsome. And uh, <laughs> good. So... The story, I think, begins, uh, well, so I'm going to just go from my memory of all the conversations mm -hmm. we had, ask you to tell parts of the story and what I think is a narrative sequence. Okay. So one thing that I understand that happened to you at some point in your life uh, is that you were drugged by somebody, a friend of yours or something, gave you some kind of drug. Is that correct? Without yes. your knowledge. And That's correct. Tell us yeah. that story. Okay. So that was uh, December 31st. Uh, twen 2000 and um, I was at a nightclub uh, in my I was 21 you know young and doctors thinking I was on top of the world had the best job in the world um, working for an internet security company chasing hackers developing um, you know anti-trojan solutions and my life was going sweet and you know very arrogant and egotistical I thought you know let's just celebrate let's have a night of good fun um, that time I asked my friend to, uh, get me a pill of MDMA. Uh, what I recall, it was nothing of the sort. Uh, it was a pill that was four times the size of a regular pill from what I remember, very acidic and very toxic. And when I swallowed it within about half an hour to an hour, my reality changed. Uh, I literally had a, a psychotic break. Uh, in the nightclub, in the fetal position, rocking backwards and forwards, everything was just distorted. There was no visual or audio hallucinations. It was just uh, delusions, beliefs, paranoia. It was just more of a, f a feeling of fear of being persecuted. And uh, that lasted for about three months, intense three months. Um, my friend at the time who I was going to college with, um, who gave me the pill, I never saw him again from that day. He uh, moved states within Australia, he moved over east and uh, started working for Google from what, from what I remember. 
and there's me feeling very sorry for myself like this guy who was my friend and did this to me and then he ends up getting the job of a lifetime you know I, I just felt very very sick in the gut about it but um in the end I mean just kind of that part of the story short it was probably one of the best things that could have ever happened to me in a way um I was very as I said I was very obnoxious egotistical uh I wasn't the best sort of character um mistreat people, backstab them, just, it was just a stupid teenage sort of attitude that I had towards life. Um, so this experience uh, allowed me to sort of have a, a form of self-reflection. So when you're paranoid, you're worried about what other people think of you, uh, you feel persecuted because of what you believe you've done, and that just totally changed my attitude towards myself and towards uh, other people around me. And that's the mental health journey start. Um, of a diagnosis of uh, paranoid schizoaffective disorder as well as uh, borderline personality disorder. So I had tendencies of uh, uh, self-harm, uh, shifting sort of uh, personality traits based on emotions. So I'd have a certain sub-personality or uh, um, based on a specific emotion, I'd be a certain person based on an emotion. So it was very horrible, basically the initial 12 years because uh, I had that belief of uh, persecution for 12 years straight. It wasn't just my friend drugged me. It got to the point of uh, believing the world was after me, like the Jesuits, the, the Catholics, the, the Illuminati at the end, you know. It was just, it was just uh, very deluded in my per from my perspective. It was very deluded, very, very... Uh, it was a sincere belief, but it was obviously not an accurate one. And the reason I say it's not an accurate one is because I'm still here. No cop or any anything has happened to me since that day that would indicate that I was being persecuted. It was just my own reality that I was trying for myself. I understand. And as you know, many people in the server have, have had their own experiences with mental illness and uh, the psychiatric system. And so, of course... Um, there's a lot of people here who are understanding of that. So your experience was a mixture of, uh, well, it's schizoaffective. So for those who don't mm -hmm. know, that's a mixture of a mood disorder with a schizotypal disorder. So it's kind of like schizophrenia with elements of bipolar. Is that and correct? that's exactly what it was. Yes, that's correct. Right. And uh, it's incredible the, the recovery that you've made because in the entire time that I have known you, you have been remarkably lucid, wise, intelligent, um, and very rarely uh, in episodes of mania or delusionality. So, to what mm. do you attribute? To what do you attribute your uh, your remarkable recovery? Okay, so first and foremost, uh, I will get into this later on as well. Um, was meeting my wife. Um, she was my rock. Um, she kept me on a level plane. She even said to me when you know during the first few months of courting, I, I told her I said I believed I was the devil you know i was that sort of in that space um and she said i know you believe it i don't it doesn't matter i still love you and that to me was the uh the kicker of yeah this woman's gonna be in my life for the rest of my life um, of course that's not the case now but you know that's what i believed back then um that was one aspect she was very supportive um helped me a lot she she insisted on me taking my medication uh, i was very uh non-compliant I'm, I'm still not compliant with medication um i don't believe i'm suffering any sort of uh side effects from not taking medication um but she, during the time when i was with her she uh she would feed me my my medication my pills make sure i stayed um stable uh the other thing was is the intentional disbelief of previous belief systems so uh, no offense to you Shogun to stop me believing I was the devil I had to stop believing in Christianity so I had to cut that out just so I did not associate myself with any sort of character in the Bible um, because it was, it was a big thing for me back then you know, I'd read it and I'd say oh I've got these sort of traits of this particular person and I would associate with that with certain characters and one dad Jesus, one dad Satan. It was just tiring. So it's um, and I and I don't feel the same way about that now. But that was a, a sort of uh, a method of um, using doing to stop me from certain types of behaviors and actions and beliefs. So that would help 
in the end, the the triggers of uh, certain delusions of being persecuted for whatever reason. Intentional, intentional disbeliefs of uh, misleading, um, basically, things that would trigger me. That's a very interesting strategy. Um, and as I'm sure you know, religious delusions, such as identifying with characters such as God, the devil, Jesus, or the Antichrist, is extraordinarily common in psychosis. And yes. it's a very common delusionality. And the Bible is a very, as you know, psychedelic and hallucinogenic book at times. And it can indeed, for some people, and at some times, play into or feedback with mental health episodes, which can also cause hyper religiosity meaning an excessive, uh, excessive fixation on religious things. So and I did have that, so yeah, I did have that form of uh, mentality um, in the sense of religious ideologies and uh, beliefs about it. Uh, it was very intense for me. So yeah, it was a tactic that I discovered myself to just say, well, if it's causing me to believe these sorts of things, Maybe I should uh, study flowers, and maybe I could be a tulip instead. You know, it's just something, it's just something totally different that would take my mind and my fixation on certain things in a certain direction. Yes, makes uh, sense. It's a good idea. Mm. So, unfortunately, your mental health struggles, severe though they were, uh, were only the beginning of your sorrows, so to speak. Your your struggle. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the most catastrophic things that's happened in your life. Uh, was the event leading to the loss of your foot mm -hmm. uh, and with it perhaps part of your leg. So please tell us that uh, unfortunate story. Okay, so my I believe I started recovering from my mental health um, ideologies in 2012, 2013. Um, but I did have an experience of side effects of the medication I was using back then. So having antipsychotics um, especially one medication called, um, named Olanzapine uh, allowed me to gain about 60 kilos in three months. So that was the initial three months that I was experiencing this psycho psychotic episode, this trigger. Uh, I gained 60 kilos within that three months. I was very slim, very, you know, very athletic. And putting on that much weight in that short amount of time um, gave me uh, sort of like a – well, it gave me diabetes for starters uh, – uh, a sort of allergic reaction to uh, insulin and the hormones associated with uh, uh, absorbing the sugars into my cells. So it wasn't just diabetes, it was something associated with that as well, which inhibited me from losing weight naturally. Uh, the my metabolism was stuffed up from the antipsychotics. Um, having diabetes led to um, heart problems as well, so it just... It, it just one thing after another it spiraled and got worse. Um, having lost my eyesight at one point, but that was after um, myself stepping on some what's called double G's. There's these things in Australia called double G's. They're prickles with three horns or pricks on them, and I stepped on a bed on a bush of uh, double G's. So my feet were coated with these prickles. Uh, the funny thing is, I didn't feel them. Um, they were really sharp, really deep in my feet. But because I had diabetes, I had neuropathy, couldn't feel them. Uh, due to the nerve damage of diabetes and the sugar just setting away at the nerves, um, I did not feel them. And having gone to emergency to see what could be done about removing them, the doc I had two doctors, one on each foot, taking about two to three hours removing each individual thistle out of my foot, you know, it was just a, it was a, it needed to be done straight away. I couldn't wait to go into a sort of a op operating theatre because of uh, the potential of them being poisonous and having suffered more complications. But in the end, it didn't matter. Um, I developed an infection from the little toxic poisons from them, and I had an operation on my left foot because I had an ulcer that appeared on my heel which then they had to scoop out all the uh, messy uh, meat and flesh. Uh, so I had one problem in my left foot. Uh, the right foot collapsed due to uh, what's called, um, what's it called, uh, Charcot foot. 
uh, as well as with the infection from the poisons of the double Gs. And the because my foot collapsed, my the, my ankle, my inner ankle would touch the floor like when when it finally collapsed. It, it was that sort of like distorted and disjointed. And but good that I couldn't feel pain, but it looked horrible. So um, I was taken to emergency. That made the instant decision to amputate. And that was it. Went into theatre uh, the next day and woke up with a missing right foot. Um, that was an awesome experience, waking up to ketamine. I mean, geez, I, that was, that, I have to look at the positives, you know, having, having an experience, a sort of semi psychedelic ketamine experience, going to the K hole, monitored by doctors, making sure I wasn't going to flip out too much. But the pain was so intense, I needed it. Um, and yeah, that was the the beginning of uh, being an amputee, and that happened in two thousand nineteen. Uh, exactly one year and a couple of months later, I was no longer married. Uh, I had been with my wife for sixteen years, and just through the uh, experience of being an amputee, as well as I suppose her being tired of having to deal with my previous mental health issues, you know. I now have this sort of regretful feeling that I couldn't believe I put her through that. But at the same time, till, till death do us part, didn't seem to mean anything. So she ended up leaving. Um, understand why it was very difficult for her to, to sort of look after me. A, a 40 year old husband needing help to go to the bathroom. It was just, it's sort of my dignity was shot. Uh, she, couldn't, she couldn't deal with it. And, and she moved on. So. That was it. That was uh, last year. I'd see. Well, yes, and that brings us to the story of your divorce, which you have uh, brought up. So mm -hmm. I guess we'll talk about that. So you're, you're, why don't you just tell us the story of how, how your divorce came about? Like, uh, in other words, the day of your divorce, which I understand is quite abrupt and in a quite an uncompassionate manner. Yeah, okay, so that the actual separation, I, I called it the divorce because that was the day that she left. Uh, obviously, the official divorce date will be May 4th this year. Um, on the day she left, uh, she warned me two weeks prior that she had enough and didn't want to be with me anymore. I, I didn't think she'd have the goals to sort of leave the way she did. Um, I had symptoms of... Uh, flu-like symptoms, so I was taken to emergency for sort of having COVID. Um, she said, I'll be back, I'm going to get some smokes, and may the 4th be with you. And I thought, that was a weird thing to say. It was May 4th, but this Star Wars quote just thrown in out of nowhere, when she wasn't even that sort of, yeah, I don't know what she was doing. It just seemed a bit silly. <laughs> it was funny, but it's about the same time. And she never returned. Um, I sent her a message, I said, where are you? And she said, uh, I'm on a bus on the way to my mother's. I've decided to leave you. Don't call me ever again. I don't want to hear from you. Um, I'm tired of having to look after a child. I don't want to hear from you ever again. Don't call me. So, and please just don't call me. And I called her, I tried to, she wouldn't answer. Um, and that was it, I was stuck at hospital, ready to come home. Not sure how I was going to get home. Um, I had to call a taxi. Uh, the hospital paid for the for the fare. Um, I didn't know where the car was at the time, um, but I went to the train station in the taxi, and the car was at the train station, um, which she she obviously left there to catch a, a train to the city to catch a bus to her mother's. Uh, I looked to see if she left the keys there or sorry, rather, I, I allowed the taxi driver to look around the car to see if the keys were in there. Uh, they weren't there, and so I asked him if he would take me to my neighbor's house. Uh, he did so, and the experience there, that, that was that was a godsend. My neighbors were heavy uh, methamphetamine users, but they had the hearts of gold. They assisted me with uh, food. They came and helped me clean up, and they just... They were gods, and if, if they weren't there, I don't know what could happen. Um, in that meantime, I did get the keys back in the mail. That took about a week. And I had contacted my brother 
who said, why do you always have to call me when she is a fan? I said, I don't have anyone else's number, mate. What can I do? Um, yeah. So that happened. He came and picked me up. Uh, he helped me clean up the place. Um, and then I got the keys back to the real estate agency and I started living with my brother and my mother in the city. Uh, two weeks later, I found the house that I'm in now and I'm currently living just with my mother. And that's where we are at this point in time. Uh, been single for a year, have been dating a few women, um, two specifically. Um, I don't think anything is gonna happen or occur uh, from these, uh, these dating that I've had, but uh, it's nice to know that I can still go out, have a meal and have a, have a yarn with someone, and talk with someone. And uh, you guys have been a godsend, you know, just being on Discord, talking to my mates, and it's as has helped and healed me a lot. Um, and I suppose the final thing that I wanted to say with regards to the physical health and mental health is that uh, I'm a big man, uh, 360 pounds, I think it is, uh, which is like 175 kilos. Um, I need to lose weight, otherwise it won't go very well for me. So I've decided to uh, get a recumbent uh, hand pedal bike, and just bear with me. I'm going to put a picture on the on this ob stream so that uh, the viewers of the stream will be able to see it. Um, and uh, that bike is uh, close between five to seven thousand um, dollars. That's the average price for these bikes, um, where you lay down, you use your hand to pedal and to um, you know, get get some sort of cardiovascular um, man your heartbeat going and riding a bike and yeah, that's where I'm up to right now. That that's the present moment and the future is looking very hopeful. So this is a very positive note uh, for me to connect to because, as you guys know, in the past we've done GoFundMe and fundraisers for members in the server who are in difficult situations. To say that this is a difficult situation is an understatement, and this piece of medical equipment is something that could profoundly change and indeed save uh, Ainsoft's life, because as he's uh, hinting at, if he isn't able to lose the weight, it's likely he could die. But if he is able to lose the weight, his chances of long-term survival go up exponentially, and as he mentioned, the bikes are quite expensive in the range of $7,000 to $25,000. Over the course of this server, we have raised uh, over $2,000 and redistributed that in each case to people struggling with mental health challenges uh, and in some cases other health cha challenges or homelessness. So I think this is a wonderful cause. Now, I asked Dan Soff about it and he said he didn't want me to do a fundraiser because he's an honorable man and he wants to try and pay for it himself. However, I'm not aware uh, of any downside to making a fundraiser available so that anyone who happens to hear this podcast and is moved by it and chooses to donate some amount of money could do so. I don't think that that would be a harmful thing. So with your permission, Ainsoff, I would like very much to do that because, as you know, in the past we've bought a bicycle for NSA. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't do that fundraiser myself, but I, you know, it was on the server. And we also uh, have got him a piece of exercise equipment that is like a chin-up bar. So there's a precedent for this, uh, and I think this is a much stronger reason than even that was, as NSA is uh, in great health compared to Insoff. So is that something I can have your permission to do, sir? Um, it will, yes, I would appreciate it. It, it would help. Hmm? It will only supplement what you're going to have to pay. It's yes, probably not thing. So it would be some amount of money, hopefully a lot, that will um, assist you in yes. this difficult I'm very meaningful and helpful for you. So if you uh, if you give me permission, uh, I would like that to be created. If Kasheka or anyone else in the room, perhaps Ryan, uh, would like to take the initiative on making that GoFundMe page, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, I think as a Canadian, I, I can't do it, plus I'm bad at that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. someone can, uh, like Kasheka or Ryan could do that, I would appreciate it. Otherwise, I'll find someone else to do it after the podcast. So I would really that's one of yeah, and we'll make sure to include a link to the fundraiser on the BitChute and YouTube uh, channels as well, um, as well as advertise it and so forth in the server as we do. I estimate that we will raise quite a bit of money. Uh, and actually, if it's okay with you, can I say a prayer? Absolutely. 
Heavenly Father, God, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray on behalf of our friend Ainsaw, firstly, that you would keep your strong hand of protection and healing on him, and that you would heal his body and his mind and soul. Keep him on the path of recovery and health, God, and grant him long life. Also, God, I ask that you will move the hearts of anybody in this room and anybody hearing this podcast on YouTube and BitChute to generously donate whatever they can afford to Ainsaw in a spirit of love. You promise that as we do unto the least of these, so we do unto you. So this is a wonderful opportunity to assist in. So I myself pledge also to support him financially this Friday when I get paid. And I just pray that you will bless him and continue to bless this server and this community, God, uh, and especially in soft. Thank you for the blessing that he has been in this community, God. Keep him with us for many years to come. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. So that being said, um, I think I'd like to also talk about some of the positive things in your life now, of which there are many. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you are someone skilled and interested in technology, computers, even hacking and programming. Is that correct? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, uh, that started in uh, 1995. I think it was uh, 15. Um, got um, access to the internet in the good old... Uh, 28.8k modems. I didn't even know. I bought a modem, didn't know you had to go through a service provider to access the internet. I thought, you know, plug it in, off you go. So that was uh, the beginning of a, of a learning experience about computers, internet technologies. And um, as I said before, in the year 2000, I uh, started my occupation in, in uh, internet security, developing um, reverse engineering techniques for uh, Trojan horses. I even discovered uh, one Trojan horse, which someone submitted, reverse engineer, found um, hacker details in the Trojan horse itself, which gave indication of their honeypot um, and their botnet. So I accessed the server. There was 800 other infected computers on the server. And I wrote a little program to connect to each individual machine and send the uninstall command for the Trojan horse. I ran that, executed it, um, each command was executed, and in the morning I woke up after 12 hours of running the script, uh, about 650 of those uh, infected computers were basically back to normal, and they, I say they because I don't know who they were, but whoever was running the botnet uh, weren't very happy, obviously, I just basically stuffed up their operation. Uh, whether um, these machines were going to be used as a distributed denial of service attack, which is like um, flooding a computer network or a computer uh, full of data so that it can't operate or serve legitimate websites, um, that that basically uh, was done the gurgler and these hackers just didn't have a leg to stand on. Um, I actually thought one of my delusions, obviously, like my drugging occurred three months later. I thought I did that. This experience was was connected to that. So just as a off topic, that that was part of the story. But uh, from then, um, I worked in um, sales and in telecommunications for um, large um, telcos uh, in Australia. Uh, there's an ISP called Ionet, uh, as well as Telstra, and I worked for both those companies in sales and technical support. Um, that, that was obviously after my, my uh, drugging. So during the diagnosis of schizoaffective, I'd get better, I'd work, I'd, I'd have a relapse, I'd not work. Um, but regardless of whether I had a job or not in technology, I was always doing something. So I'd learn how to develop websites, um, I'd, I'd learned basic coding, I wasn't too good at that, but I did basic coding, learned website administration, learned how to create, create forums, uh, learned the intricacies of, you know, obviously creating accounts for social media and how to run them and run uh, uh, social media and uh, influence uh, websites associated with social media. So there's, there's some just stuff associated with that. I uh, did a lot of internet marketing, creating ebooks, and yeah, just it was really fun. It was, uh, computers are a really good thing. There's always something to do. And um, yeah, I had, I was, there was also something else associated to, that, associated to that, but when I remember, I'll bring it up. So. Okay, so uh, that is very interesting. And um, I know you had also planned to do some extra schooling in the future. Mm. Talking about also 
programming. Uh, you had an idea for a virtual reality assisted um, mental health mental health, uh, mental mm. health program. Are you still interested in that project, or did you? Uh, that that went by the wayside, but the idea is still still at the forefront. Uh, just how I'm going to achieve it might be might be a, a different story. So um, I'll I'll explain it, and if someone can run with it, that'd be great. So something that I experienced, um, a sort of a delusion that I went through, was called the Truman Experience, where I believed that uh, the world around me was like the Truman Show. My family weren't my family. My friends weren't my friends. They were all actors. And um, things were being done to trigger me intentionally or to help me recover intentionally. So it wasn't paranoia, but it was what's called pronoia, where the universe is out to help you. <laughs> that that's uh, something that I learned. So, if I had that experience, what's the possibility that other people went through something similar? And whilst I was in in psychiatric uh, in the psychiatric ward, which at one time I did a six month uh, long term rehabilitation, uh, I noticed that some of the the care workers and social workers would use parts of my own delusions to help me recover. Um, whether that be to uh, attack these thoughts intentionally or to trigger them to see my reactions and whatnot, uh, I thought that would be that that idea would would go really well. I suppose in the real world, not just in an isolated environment, but also using technologies technologies like augmented reality, virtual reality, or even just simple uh, actors. You know, if you know that there's somebody who's suffering a very distinct intense experience of delusional or psychotic behavior and they are in the public um sort of in the public atmosphere and you don't want them to sort of flip out do something that that may cause them to cause harm to themselves or to other people what can the community do to assist them help them help them recover and that was through my experience with the Truman Show so that there could be actors, and, and I understand it's a very sensitive issue because it could trigger them if they found out, but if there was actors that um, sort of came up to me and said, hey, Rod, uh, you know, do you know anything about all this hacking stuff? Uh, I was there, you know, and just just something that would that would help me get better, you know, an experience, uh, whether it be a little, little act or something of some sort. Um, so that was something I wanted to get interested in. I did my research in in how to go ahead with that. And the, that was uh, having a degree in uh, psychology as well mixed with other forms of um, computer technology stuff. That would have been a long journey, six years at university, something I didn't, I wasn't motivated enough to do. So that went by the wayside. But, you know, it's still something that I would hope could be done somehow. Yes. Absolutely. It's a great idea. And especially with the enhancing degree of, you know, immersive virtual reality, the possibilities for mental health is endless. It's a hugely, uh, I see that as being a huge practical way to treat mental illness would be using virtual reality, although the details would have to be hammered out. So if that comes in the future, just remember you have the idea. Yeah. But um, another thing I want to talk to you now is about spirituality. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm a religious person and a Christian, but uh, you have very interesting spiritual beliefs, um, although I couldn't necessarily categorize them or define them. Could you categorize or define your own beliefs in any way, or how would you describe yeah. your current uh, orientation? I actually found out what my belief system was called only a couple of days ago. Um, well, there was a member on here, I can't remember who it was, uh, but he brought it up, and he said it's a form of eclecticism, eclect, eclecticism, where basically... Um, it's a mishmash of nearly everything that can possibly exist and it's my own ideology and belief. It's not really uh, a dogmatic belief system, but it's sort of an acceptance of many things uh, and the possibility that all these things could exist, I allow them to exist. And although I don't know and can't prove them, uh, I do have an aspect of uh, an eclectic, that's what it is, an eclectic sort of belief system. So if there was a dogmatic um, spiritual belief, it'd be panentheism, and that's the idea that uh, God exists within 
the physical universe as well as beyond space and time. So it encompasses everything and anything that exists. Uh, how it manifests, that's where I don't know, but panentheism allows for that. So that the universe is divine, everything that exists outside of the physical universe is divine, and that is all that exists, just the monad or the spiritual uh, creator of everything, and we are just reflections of the greater whole. Whether that exists as Christianity, whether that exists as Judaism or any Abrahamic religion or Buddhism or, or Hinduism, um, the, it allows for that, uh, but I don't sort of um, sort of worship any sort of ideology in that aspect. Right. So we've covered a lot of ground here. Um, I'm wondering, is there anything in particular that you wanted to talk about um, while you have the audience and the platform? Yeah, there's, there's one thing. Uh, one thing that uh, I'm very grateful for is the recent creation of what's called the NDIS, or the National Disability Insurance Scheme, by the Australian government. Uh, it existed. It didn't exist prior to five years ago. And although my mental health and physical health have you know, have been in, in decline, uh, the government and this particular system have acknowledged that I'm actually going through something quite severe and have provided funding as well as support for my recovery. So uh, last year I was granted basically $110,000, $115,000. I don't have physical access to that, that funding, but it allows for services, it allows me to have a wheelchair, you know, it covers those sorts of things that are that allow me to improve my life. And I'm very grateful for having that because if, if I didn't have that, then I'd be absolutely great without a paddle. And uh, um, it's a very good system to to help people in my situation to move forward and recover. And uh, I'm currently going through what's called a change of circumstances and review um, my year for the NDIS, it expires in two months' time, but I need a change of circumstances. That's an extra avenue of receiving funding specifically for housing. So I'll be uh, looking for what's called the SDA or the Special Disabilities Advantages um, funding so I can get my own home. Not just to live with my mum, but to live in my own home, be independent and have the... Um, the equipment and housing built for specifically for my situation. So large bathrooms, large wide open doors so I can get through with a wheelchair, uh, supports on the roof so I can lift myself up, um, you know, just, just things built for me and that I can pay for with my funding. And the beautiful thing is, is though, even though I get funding, I also get the disability support, which um, I'll only have to pay 25% out of my income for living in my own home so that that's that's just great news it, it allows me to live freely without the encumbrances of being restricted of, uh, of income cash flow will be more freely accessible and it's just a great thing to have so yeah i just wanted to say uh, that's the happy ending that's the silver lining it's it it, it allows me to live as an abled man with in a disabled body but in an environment where I can actually achieve these things. That is a beautiful, happy ending to the story. Uh, it has a wonderful narrative completion to it. So I think that's a good place to end the formal interview. Would you like to take questions from the audience or would you like to conclude the interview now and just go talk? I don't mind. Stories? I'm happy to take some questions if people have anything that they want to share or ask away. Mm. Okay. Um, does anyone have a question for Insaf while he's here, or a comment? Going once, going twice. Okay, well thanks so much Insaf, I really appreciated this interview. Um, if you ever want to do another one, you know the drill, just send me mm -hmm. a DM, I'll set it up anytime, I'd love to do another one anytime. And uh, we continue to wish you the best in your recovery, in your health, and uh, in your life. And we're glad to have you handling the Roundtable YouTube channel. Uh, the video channel, that is, uh, on mm -hmm. which this very podcast will be uploaded, so you can find links to that in the announcements channel. It will be in the RT podcast. And you can also find uh, all our other podcasts, hundreds of great audio podcasts, on YouTube and BitChute. 
make sure you check out our web store. Great merchandise by scientists, amazing artists. It's got some great new designs coming out. I'm going to be buying a hoodie and a t-shirt on Friday. Like and subscribe to our videos and join the Roundtable Discord server where you can talk to me and Ainsoff and everybody else every single day and live special events recorded and uploaded daily. So that being said, thanks everybody. Uh, thank you, Ainsoff. God bless. Let's uh, actually we can stay right here since mm -hmm. um, we're already in the video chat room, which is nice. So that is the end of the interview, and we are now back in the regular chat.